So to look ahead to this weekend's Football League semi-finals and relegation playoffs, I'm joined by 2002 Ireland Ireland winner with our man, Ronan Clark. Ronan, how is the format yourself? Oh, great. Jay, you about it yourself? Good. Not too bad. Keeping well. I suppose we'll, we'll dive in and we'll probably look at Division 1. I suppose we'll, we'll probably focus on the relegation games because we might touch on a bit later. These probably are the two games of most significance. So we'll start with a game that involves our own two counties, Armagh versus Roscommon. These two counties did a good rivalry back in the late 70s and early 80s and it seems to be heading that way again with recent championship and league meetings proving to be blockbusters between these sides. But Roscommon winning both those games. But Armagh are the side coming into this with a bit more form. Some might say they were a little bit unlucky not to secure the Division 1 status the last day out against Donegal, while Roscommon come into this game with three defeats from the South Group. So as an Ironman man, man yourself, are you confident that they can finally end the hoodoo against Roscommon and retain their Division 1 status for next year? Um, I think the, the big thing is here is a home advantage that Armagh have. Like, and as you said before there, like Roscommon's come up here a couple of times and, and uh, pipped Armagh at the post now. But uh, I expect Armagh will have too much of them, especially the form going into it. They're... Uh, like the likes of the O'Neills there and Stephen Camel, who's on fire at the minute there, uh, I think it's just uh, too much for the Roscommon defence. So I would say Armagh by two or three, I think. Hopefully now. Yeah, well, I might be hoping for two or three the other way. You mentioned there, Armagh's kind of four players, something that was always kind of really praised down through the years and wasn't a weak link of their team. They brought in Kieran Donaghy uh, into the kind of the forwards coaching. As you mentioned, they're like Stephen Campbell, won six throughout this league campaign. Rion O'Neill, who kind of seems to be stepping out from the shadow of, of uh, or sorry, Ocean O'Neill seems to be stepping out of the shadow of his brother Rion with six points as well this year. And Rory Grugan with 14 points. They are posting very, very impressive scores. Yeah, so I just think, as you said, Armagh were very unlucky in the, the league games that I've seen. Like, you know, uh, just not seeing the league games out, like, especially, it's probably just the, the different tempo from, you know, the Division 2 and the Division 1. But uh, they're going the right direction. Kieran seems to be working well from there. In the forward line, anyway, you know they're putting up good scores, and Kieran McKeever's in with Kieran there, uh, and the fantasy they think they're they're strong too. Like so, overall, I believe it'd be it'd be a great entertaining game again. Uh, again, Ross Common, I watched them against Dublin. Thought they're very unlucky and bit naive at times, and then the Kerry game, I thought they were very impressive against Kerry, now, especially the long long range points. It says it was very very good to watch that. Yeah, just maybe one kind of slight area of concern for Armagh. The start game is really quickly. They were 1-3 to nothing up before Monaghan registered score and opened the game. I think they were 6-1 up against Donegal uh, just after the first half water break. But it's just the way they kind of seem to drift off in games. I think only one score in the last 10 minutes against Tyrone. And the longer that game went on, the more and more Tyrone seemed to want to win that by. And then Jamar Hall put them four points up, I think, in the 63rd minute against Donegal. And they couldn't see it out. They ended up trying to draw in the game. So... Probably goes back to the area point bit by bit. They're still maybe just adapting to that Division 1 pace and tempo or maybe that little bit of a drop-off they might have got away with in Division 2. Oh, it's like, it's like people people have to realise that the, the, the tempo different is significant in this year, you know, playing, playing in, from Division 2 up in Division 1. Like, and I've played there a couple of years myself. Like, and it's tough, like, you know, to, especially to see area games, but Armagh's got a history of not really seeing out games or trying to coast over the line, which you can't do nowadays because like, teams are out there more physically and physically fit now that they'll see the you know 60 70 minutes of football out like but uh yes Armagh start well but it's probably like in some occasions Armagh don't didn't start well like and Keane's probably put that into their you know the locker there that you know we need to start games well here and then just try and build a bit of consistency in that there and probably you probably will do over the due course like yeah and um of course, a couple of injury problems, obviously, that Tyrone game as well, ruled out the likes of Aidan Falk and Ryan Kennedy for the Donegal game. Remains to be seen if they'll be back for this one. But James Morgan did make a quick kind of turnaround as well, and he was back for the yeah. that Donegal match. You know, that is something as well that they'd be hoping to get kind of them two players back, Aidan and Ryan, because especially that morning game, Aidan was just so influential. He was. Uh, not their game, he was excellent at their game, and he's a big player for Armagh. Like, and even at club level here in Armagh, you've seen him in the county final last year, he was excellent again. He gives out their more balance to the team, I think, anyway. Uh, but if they get him on the field, um, like, you know, it would be difficult to talk to, i tell you the truth. Though. Yeah, just touch on Roscommon. You mentioned it there, and a lot of people did give them a good bit of praise for their performance against Kerry and, and their batting qualities. But maybe this is just the Roscommon man and me kind of come out. I, I, even though it was a dead rubber, we still would have ended up in this situation anyway. But... When Tyke Morley gets sent off in the 53rd minute, Kerry only leading 13 points to 12 at the time. Roscommon had battled really well for that 50-odd minutes. But 
you know, when a man extra running, here's a great chance to get a win and lay down a kind of a statement prove we belong at this level. Kerry outscored Roscommon 2 2 to a goal in that last 20 odd minutes and just seemed to go to extra gears. So Roscommon just weren't able to deliver. That for me was a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, yes, but sometimes when teams go down to 14 men, uh, you know, they seem to lift, lift their game and, you know, by start to work a wee bit harder. And, and plenty of times in my own experience, like you can see out there, it's very difficult to play against 14. Uh, but Kerry, not their point, like, you know, if you look at the quality Kerry have, like, and you always know there's a, there's a gear or two left in them. And I think they really coasted through this year league campaign. And uh, I think they're really going for, you know, a championship. And that's what I think, and that their eye is in the ball. Like. Yeah, just even kind of another like interesting stat about Roscommon, maybe it just kind of shows the makeup of the two divisions. With um, 47 scores between goals and points combined, they still end up with nine more scores than the top team or top scores in Division 1 North, Donegal. But defensively, you know, they end up conceding 68 scores between goals and points. I think that was 29 more than the worst defence in Division 1 North, Monaghan. So I think... That's that alone probably just sums up Roscommon. Very, very easy on the eye to watch kind of going forward, but still let teams cut through them far too easy at the back. Ah, yes, like, but as you, as you said, like the difference between Division 1 and Division and the Division 2, like, you know, you get more quality forwards. Like you, get, you, you, you have to keep an eye on all six midfielders who are starting to come through half-backs. Uh, but I would defensively, like, Armagh too, some people say, I might, might say that Armagh is lacking defensively too, like, but... I just think, in the overall thing, I think we were in for a cracking game. Uh, it'd be a high intensity game, like on Russ Common will fear Armagh, you know, especially coming up in the Armagh because they've done it twice already here. So I'm just, I'm just looking forward to it. Tell you the truth. Yeah, it'll be all eyes on GA go three o'clock on Sunday. As you mentioned, Russ Common do kind of hold the slightly upper hand at two twenty two to one nineteen victory in the championship three years gone in. Last year, the game that more or less kind of clinched promotion for us, Gorman, a 3 10 to 15 point win against Armagh. And I was saying it a few weeks ago to your former uh, teammate, Stevie McDonald, that like Armagh actually looked quite comfortable in that game. Then Roscommon got two goals in as many yeah. minutes and kind of turned the game. Just even come your own kind of point of view, we touched on Roscommon, half the psychological edge. Was there ever kind of a case maybe in, in your own days where with Armagh, there was just that one team that on the field of play, you're always able to match them, but just couldn't get over the line, or maybe the other way around, no matter what kind of scenario in the game, when you were playing with Armagh, what situation in the game, you always felt you were going to win it. Uh, there's many teams, like, the next, like, if we if we knew we were in a battle to the end, like, and every team, like, you know, would, especially, it depends what way, you know, people were looking at it, the way we were looking at it, and we never took any team and taken any team for granted, so we always knew we were going in for a battle, but one springs the mind would probably we're always know we're going to get a difficult against Monaghan and like Ulster football it was at that time was main field like you, you just didn't know what was going to come out like and uh, but they always seemed they always seemed to try and get the upper hand and you know games where you know when it's put us would kick on a bit but then as I said before like like we would take the foot off the paddle then and then try and coast over the line which then let teams back in and I don't know was that was that a, a big psychological thing on our part but I think we just coasted across and just said like you know we've done enough here like we'll leave it to the next day but some days it was iffy like and but then we got caught out in the likes of carries like you know they keep coming coming at you and put us under serious pressure I think it was 05 in the or it was beat, beat us in the quarter final like you know the, we, we were coasting again in the first half Stevie scored a couple of goals they were playing well, and Kerry kept coming up the field and just, you know, a drop of the ball, like the, the ball was in the net, and, you know, getting the rub of the greenness. Like, and it always, always seemed like, you know, we're always looking over the shoulder if they're coming back to us, but eventually they run out winners out there. But I believe that we're the better team that they're there. Yeah, just another thing that just comes to my mind there that always seemed to kind of be well able for you was for Mana, obviously beating you at 2004. Core final Core Park. And I think as well, then in 2006, they brought you to a semi final in Ulster as well, or to a replay. In also the semi final, so it was also final. Was it was six? Was the final? We even actually been yeah. We actually were. I think we were, I think we were near ten points up at half time, and uh, they they actually came to just put us under serious pressure the whole game. That was one of the end their games where you just you know, we couldn't get our hands on the ball. We couldn't you know you know uh, we couldn't you know cut through their defense anymore. You know we just found that we had to fight for everything. Like but eventually it came good in the replay anyway. But it, we're near, we're near drifted into that there mindset here. We wound up about four or five up, and then Stevie got the gold, 
and then we tried to coast over the line, but they just kept coming back at us. Like, but it was always great tussles. Like you, you know yourself, looking at Ulster football through the years, yeah. like you know, it's always tough, and it always goes down to the wire. Like. Yeah, especially that period during the nineties, like when you had Fermanagh, and Derry, yeah. when you go, oh, we're always there, there knocking about in our Ireland series as well. We'll move on to the other game uh, in the Division One rele- relegation playoff on Sunday. That's uh, Monaghan versus Galway and Clonus at three forty-five. And I suppose it's the game that's going to bring a little bit kind of controversy because of Pork Joyce's comments after the game against uh, Dublin. I suppose, look, what do you kind of make of yourself? I could see where, where, where Pork is kind of coming from. I know the rules state they had two home games. Monaghan were technically meant to have one home game taken away from them, but that was taken away from them because they broke COVID rules. And as Pork still feels, they're now actually being rewarded for it, despite the fact they broke the rules. Yes. I know, as you said, like, I understand where he's coming from. But in, in saying that there, like, you know, the, it was a draw and Monaghan's got the home draw and so be it, like... So, uh, but again, it's a home advantage to Monaghan. Like, uh, I don't think over the years, like, you know, we, Galway don't really travel that way, especially up in the northern teams here. So, uh, I fancy Monaghan for that there, tell you the truth. Yeah, you probably would have seen a good bit of Monaghan, obviously, because the Pedro Armad we touched on in the opening weekend, they've been kind of top to terrible themselves in, in the uh Ulster group obviously recovered after that to get two draws, but two games they arguably could have won. I think they were still six points up with 25 minutes ago against Donegal, three points up coming down the final hurdle against Tyrone. Didn't actually need a, a kick with the last score or a point with the last kick of the game from Ryan McNess, which forced extra time. It seems to be kind of a little bit of a transition up here for them. They've brought in a couple of young players. Kevin Novell has really impressed midfield, Sean Jones, Aaron Mulligan sent forward, Andrew Woods as well. And another player as well that's kind of caught my eye. He kind of came to attention that league game against Dublin a couple of years ago, Stephen O'Hannon, but he looks like now, to me, he's kind of delivering on that potential. But as you said, they're, I think they're still in transition, like, and they're not relying on Conor McManus anymore, and he'll be, like, I remember watching the Donegal game, and Monon really impressed me that their day with their work rate, and, you know, the intensity to get, you know, they brought to the game, which I caught, I thought that, you know, Donegal were caught in the back foot by it, they didn't expect it, and uh, now that I'm saying before there, that they're not relying on Conor anymore, so uh, there's by stepping up the plate here, like, and they've got more, they've added more to their armor, like, you know, at the back, and you know, they're scoring press, like, you know, there's, there's some excellent individuals up there, like. Yeah, but just even then, like looking at um, from a Galway point of view, I think it's probably fair to say after they got that annihilation against Kerry in day one, and still happened to play Dublin, they were probably going to end up in this situation. But the fact that they bet their near neighbours were Scotland, whether you can say they were shadow box from the championship game in mind or not. And they, okay, maybe never probably look quite look like beating Dublin, but always only a kick of a ball behind and can come away with a lot of credibility from that. They have recovered quite well and shown a, a couple of character about them. Of course, I, I couldn't believe the carry result at the, you know, at the, at the very start. Uh, but Porg Jice have played with Porg in the international rules. No, and Porg wouldn't still in them. Like, he's a football man and he, he's a great work ethic, you know, around the management side of things. Like, and, uh, you can say that they're like they lost a wee bit of confidence in themselves, but uh, I think over the last couple of games, like they're still that there again, especially like you know the, the Ross Common victory. Like I thought that, that there was a good, I thought it was a good enough game. Like, but as you say, it's like you know championships go around the corner, and there's just probably a bit of shadow boxing going on there. But uh, that'd be an interesting one too. Like. Yeah, and you mentioned even though Pork has to give out, but going up to Monaghan, the last time they did make the trip up there for a league match 2019, they did actually win. So, look, it's not beyond them. Just even as well, like from Galway kind of point of view, you know, Kerr Finn have been the dominant club side of the last kind of couple of years, and it's always been a case of trying to get their players into the Galway team. And they seem to be getting a good kind of gel and balance there. And a couple of players that kind of come in this year, uh, Dylan McHugh with the centre back and Kieran Malloy as well. Like when you are such a dominant force at club level, if you can get them into your county team, it's always going to help raise the standards. Oh yes, yeah, certainly. Like you know, they've they've done it over the you know many years now. Like and uh, but as you say, as taking so many in, you know, to getting that their correct balance in the team, uh, which poor would probably you know sit down and after this here campaign, and hopefully like he's hoping for a victory here on Sunday here uh, that they can sit down and prepare for championship. But I still think that like, you know it'd be very hard to beat. In Connacht, I think they would be very hard to beat. Like. Yeah, of course, the, that game against Roscommon, only three weeks on the horizon as well, but there's no doubt about it, both them teams will still want to be Division 1 status going into that yeah. match. We touched on it there at the start. Like The main reason we, we want to focus on the relegation games is because the Division 1 semi-finals are not going to lead to finals regardless of what happens here. 
Kerry and Dublin or Kerry and Donegal are both out in championship in two weeks. So whoever wins these games on Saturday are going to end up sharing the honours of the league. It's again another thing that's raised kind of a lot of talking points about no finals. And maybe fair enough in other divisions, most important matters of relegation and promotion are going to be decided. But in Division One, it's kind of hard not to feel there's going to be a challenge match like to these games. Like you even look at it as well, logistics point of view, Dublin and Donegal have agreed to play in a neutral venue. But Tyrone have to make over a 301-mile trip and five ha half hours in a car or bus down to Clarny to play a game against Kerry that doesn't really have anything major at stake. Yeah, again, it's, they're looking at the, uh, probably championship here. And it's going to be shadow boxing. They're going to probably try a new type, whatever. Like, But he says like you couldn't read too much into anything in, in these here games. Like, you know, to me, like... Like not having a league final is, is probably one of the you know the highlights of the year in you know the football calendar and the county and you know in county setups like so not having that there I think Crook Park would need to take a lot hard look at themselves like because it was a spirit it's a great spec you know every spectator in the country wanted to see a league final like and especially if it, if it carry and uh, Dublin came through their respective games. You know, people have wanted to see that there match and see what way they're shaping up for championship. Like, and, and down the line, like, you know, all league fans have always been excellent in preparation for championship. So I don't know why it's, you know, this year it's it's just a colonial to me to tell you the truth. Yeah, I know, like, the league with Ridgeman starting end of April or end of February, and we are a little bit up against time. But, like, surely, as you said, like, the GA, they could have looked and said, like, we can squeeze an extra Sunday out of this. We can just push the little things back a further week. Like, the Ireland football final still is only the end of August. It's still a little bit of tradition ahead of what the normal day would be like, that they could have found some sort of arrangement or even try and make something like they do in the herd. And if these two teams that win on Saturday end up coming across each other in championship, double it up as a league final as well. Yeah, that, 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 that would probably be me kind of thinking too. Like, you know, if they, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, and just even like... Um, looking at some of the, kind of the talking points heading around uh, these games as well. Like the North group, obviously, you look at the nature. Monaghan finished bottom of two points. Donegal finished top of four points. Nothing between them. Do, this, do you still kind of feel that the Northern teams are getting kind of spite as close as they are with each other? They are getting kind of closer to Dublin or is Kerry still kind of proven by the fact that they're able to go out and go toe-to-toe -to -toe and get a draw with them that they still probably are the leading of the chasing pack? Like, I'll... I think still Dublin or or miles ahead, not on the odd team that I've seen. Like, you know, they seem to have that there just conveyor belt and boys coming in, and they're, they're just drawing out results. It's just amazing to watch. Like, and then people will come in to me and and talk to me about football, and then they say about their funding and all this here. But yes, like uh, she and Larry is putting uh, pumping money in the coffee at the minute. Like, and that be a good, you know, a uh, good. I'll, you know, keep an eye on and see will they develop over the next couple of years by that in their investment. Uh, but in saying that, there, uh, I just don't see anybody catching them at the minute. Uh, yes, Kerry make it closer. Also, teams are working hard. Like, but as you said, also the also campaign up here, like yeah, it's tough football. Like, you know, and the likes. And what I mean to get there, like in many years we came out of Ulster, like you know, you you knew you were in games, like you know, and. Alexa Carr, you know, they'll play one game and then they're up at the Crook Park and then you'd be going, well, you know, what's the story here? Like, you know, we're all fresh faced and this can be, we'd be all battle worn. And, but, uh, and saying that there, like, Donegal, yes, you know, they're probably at the pick of, you know, all start the minute. They'd be hoarding from last year after what Calvin done, like, you know, uh, I think they had an A probably on uh, Dublin in the semi final that third year. But uh, I think just, I just think that. Ulster football is at a, in a good place at the minute, like, and it's all about on the day, as you probably know, like, it's all on the day and who performs, you know, will get across the line. So, you still think Dublin will go ahead the, the rest? So, you wouldn't kind of read too much in the fact that Kerry got that draw in that league game and third is that sure. if that was if push came to show, Dublin would have probably still won that game by maybe a similar margin they won the replay by a couple yes. of years ago. Yeah, I, would, I, just, I, just, you, I just think the streaks ahead at the minute. Yeah, just kind of touched on Tony Gall as well, and I suppose a big talking point around them is about Michael Murphy picking up an injury against Monaghan, and can they kind of play without him? Are they the same team? And why they struggled for large parts against 
or a mad they kind of came good towards the end probably read the situation probably knew a draw was going to be nothing because once they got level they didn't kind of seem to show that initiative to go on and win the game so they probably knew the kind of mathematics coming into that game but one player who's really kind of stood up for him we've always known he's had the potential since he burst on the scene is, is Paddy McBrearty he's had a fantastic league today so far I think eight points the last day 20 points in total we've heard a lot of talk about Conor Callaghan and David Clifford and why they are a good bit kind of younger and still have maybe more years ahead of them do you still think someone like a player McBrearty belongs in the same conversations then or that Conor and David just are that different class altogether yeah, I always rated McBurdy very, very highly. Like an excellent footballer. I watched him down Armagh a couple of years ago uh, when they, they played him in the championship, and he was excellent out there. And then he was, you know, he got the cruciate injury, and it's tough coming back from cruciate. Like you know, mm-hmm. people say, you know, it it'll take a year, but psychologically and then you know, physically, it's normally two years when you get it back up to speed where you are. Like. Uh, but yes, he'd be in the same category of Clifford Knob because he can turn a game in his head, you know, at his own individual brilliance. Uh, but uh, yes, I would put them in the same category, no problem. Yeah, we might just uh, touch down then some of the other divisions just before we kind of wrap up. Division two, the promotion playoffs on Sunday. Clare first is Mayo, they have home advantage in Cusack Park at a quarter to two. And then the Leinster Derby between Kadir and Mead in St. Conlon's Park at two o'clock as well. And Sunday, the relegation playoffs is down versus Le- Leach and Park Esther at quarter past six on Saturday. And Cork versus West Mead and Park Creeve at two o'clock on the same day. Have you got much of an opportunity to watch um, Division Two so far this year? Obviously, Mayo with the standout name there. And as someone said to me at training last night, they couldn't have asked for an easier return to Division One if it works out only having to win four games as opposed to probably traditionally having to win your you're five or six now. That's still not putting it down that they're going to be Clare, who surprised a lot of people in this league campaign. Yeah, I've, I've watched Clare before, and you know, like, uh, Collins has done unbelievable work with them there. You know, and Arma was lucky to get out of a you know a win there down there last year. Uh, but in saying that, there I just think Mayo have too much experience for them at that their level, uh, and. But it should be a good game. All like it should, it should be a good game. But I would say I would say Mayo, would just to tip the scale and you know an experience like. But Kirby pushing right to the wire now. Yeah, just long term going ahead for the for the rest of the year. Like obviously the fact they're not going to play against a Division One team until they potentially reach a provincial final because they're on the weaker side of the draw. Kind of, do you think that would make any kind of difference in terms of Mayo or maybe that bit of freshness because we know they're battle hard and we know we're going to get them. It's not going to overly affect them. That's probably probably a relief to them, you know, being that their side. And I don't think it's, you know, psychologically it won't be a big problem to them. I think that, you know, it probably, as you said, it probably just refresh everything for them. And uh, as as it says, like, you know, over the years they're battle hardened, like you know, they had a tough tough few years there. But it's it's amazing how they come back the whole time, like they come back and they keep giving everything they have, like, and they'll be there about to the end of the year too, like I believe anyway. Yeah, just maybe another team as well from the um, Division Two, Cork. You know, who albeit only came up in Division Three last year, would have been expected to be in the promotion shakeup. You can say they're unfortunate when you're missing out on scoring difference in the end, but could be facing a return back down to Division Three if they lose to Westmead on Saturday. It just kind of seems to be the same old story with Cork year after year. Like I thought last year after the bet kind of carried that they were going to kind of kick on, yeah. then yeah. they lost to Tipperary, and once again this year it's been up and down. Yeah, like last year was a big year for them, you know, after a turn over Kerry, like, and watched that game, like an opportunity goal at the end. Uh, this year, I was expecting big things from them. Yeah, but uh, they're in a dogfight here on Sunday, but I think they'll come out of that there, like. I think, and they'll push on, I think they'll push on again, like, you know, because of plenty of friends down in Cork, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to say too much things about them there. Yeah. You mustn't have too many friends in Westmead, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. We'll just move on and briefly maybe finish up with um, Division 3, because you talk about Ulster back in the day, it used to be a minefield, and you're looking up at Division 3 this year, it's shaping up, it could be that way as well, because Derry and Fermanagh both could be promoted over the weekend. Derry have to play Limerick, and Fermanagh have to play Offaly, and we have the possibility of last year's provincial champions, Cavan, facing a triple relegation to face when they play... Uh, Wicklow in the neutral venue of Cavan or, or neutral venue of Navan even over the weekend. <laughs> yeah, uh, I watched uh, Derry against Cavan like, and I thought Derry has 
made giant strides this year. Year Connor Gloss in the middle there, and uh, Axton in the forward line also. Uh, Darren, Paddy Talley, uh, you know, I played under Paddy, and Paddy's a great manager and great coach. Uh, so they'll be up for the fight too. Uh, and unfortunately for Calvin, like, is you know, we just don't know at the minute. Like, you know, are they still at the hangover from uh, the Ulster final there last year? And uh, but it's going to be very intriguing. Like. Yeah, just even on Derry, like everyone's kind of talked about the rapid progression, how much they've kind of improved this year. But I kind of felt, if you look back after the inter-county game returned after lockdown last year, I kind of felt there were signs anyway. They bet Longford when they were going strong in the league, and I think they followed up to end their league campaign with Offaly with a win there. And only missed out in head-to-head. And if you think back to that championship game, I know it was a dirty day in, in Celtic Park, but they pushed their Armagh all the way. So there was kind of signs that they were building even a little bit last year under Rory Gallagher. Ah, yeah, Rory, yes. You know you know what system Rory plays. Everybody knows the system, like, and they work hard for each other. But if you look at Derry, like, you know, the clubs around Derry, they have amazing talent, you know, and it's just trying, you know, get them their boys to jail and to get the right balance in the team, like, and and they'd be hard to talk to on their day, like, you know, if they get everything together. Yeah, and just, just finally, Division 4, you might have a small bit of interest here because your former uh, teammate, uh, John McEntee is over Sligo. I know, obviously, from being a West Ireland man myself, Sligo, you know, always pride themselves on being very, very super competitive and, and feel on their day. They can definitely always beat Roscommon and maybe beat Galway or Mayo, but they've they've fallen a long way from that. They're now going to be playing a third year in Division Four. They failed to get in this promotion shake up. It's you know, even like you you'd know yourself, like from you know playing them in two thousand and two as well. Like there used to be just such a good kind of football powerhouse, and it's just kind of slipped down the radar for them. Uh, but yeah, and saying that there, like you know, John he, he, or Tony, to Tony there is it? Oh, I was, I was just, I was a little bit trying to. I was even saying it myself. <laughs> but uh, no, I think, you know, he'd bring a wealth of experiences down to them, and uh, hopefully now they just you know get a performance here on Sunday, you know, take them out of that there. But as you said, used to be a great footballers, and you know, and used to be a powerhouse like them. Uh, but unfortunately, that like. Hopefully that there comes again for them. Like, but they got the right man in the helm anyway. It's good to hear. And you're you're still back in your former teammate, one of the one, one of the McEntees anyway. One of the McEntees was just saying. Yeah. Right? I guess so, the, other, the other one mightn't be too far away either. Rowan, yeah. thanks very much for your time today. I hope you have a, you have a good weekend up until about three o'clock on Sunday anyway. No, boys. Thank you very much. Now. All right, take care. Bye, bye.